So if you're dealing with slow motility issues and all the misery that can come along with that, in this video I want to help you understand the most common underlying causes for this whole digestive tract to be moving a little bit slower. And I've covered a lot of these topics in other videos, but it was a question from a user that made me realize I've never done a video on slow motility. I was like, what are you even talking about? But it was over on one of our shorts videos for signs that bile is not flowing well. The user MIMH said, what if you can't poop like a champion due to slow motility and bile is pooling in the stomach? And a lot of people that are told that they have slow motility, they sort of feel like that is the problem. They don't understand that slow motility is a symptom of other things that are creating the problem. So just keep in mind, I don't know MIMH, I'm not giving them any advice. And remember that I'm not a doctor, I'm not giving you any type of medical advice. I'm just a schmuck comic turned nutrition author because when I lost my voice for eight years, 23 different doctors couldn't help me find the answers. And so I had to dig for my own answers. And what's interesting 20 years later, and I've been researching all this stuff, I found everything that I needed to know in the medical literature. And yet none of those 23 doctors knew any of that stuff. So I'm going to share some studies here. It's okay if I stand in front of these, we'll make them big. And I'm going to put links in the description below so that you can dig into this and you can just view this as an educational video that'll help you find some insights that will allow you to ask your doctor the right questions. So when we're looking at slow motility, and there can be a lot of different, you know, kind of versions of this or different names for this, things like slow peristalsis and intestinal dysmobility or lazy colon syndrome and, you know, gastroparesis, delayed gastric emptying. A lot of these things can have similar issues that we're going to talk about here. And we have videos on some of those other topics. I'll put links in the description below if you want to dig into some of those other topics as well. But the process of this bolus of food that you have consumed moving through the digestive tract is really a complicated process. There's all these like neurons and inner neurons and motor neurons and all these hormones that are involved in making this digestive tract contract and relax in a way that moves this bolus through there. It's really quite incredible how it happens and it's quite complicated. So I think that makes the, the medical world kind of view this as like, well, the solution to this must be very complicated as well. But in this video, we're going to give you a different viewpoint of what if it's not that complicated. We're looking at all these things like the enteric nervous system that's involved in moving these things through there. The vagus nerve is involved in this situation. All these neurons have to feel that, oh, there's something is stretching me. So that means it's time to move this through. So it's a very complicated process. But the way that we view it is that this bolus of food moves through the intestinal tract at a pace according to its acidity level. So if that bolus is far too acidic, then it will move through here very quickly because the body's basically saying, hey, this is gonna like digest a hole through the lining of my intestinal tract. I gotta move this out of here. So it'll bring all the water that it can to cool it down and it'll rush it out the back door and then it lifts us off the toilet like a rocket when we have crazy diarrhea. So that's one possible cause of diarrhea is just this bolus is too acidic so it's moving too quickly. But when it's leaning too far on the alkaline side, it will move through here too slowly. So let's understand why that might happen. When we want to look at the digestive process, the first step here is for the stomach to make hydrochloric acid or HCl. And this stomach acid is there to help us start acidifying that food so that we can break it down and get all the nutrients out of that food. And I understand all oh, a person's got to chew and there's saliva and all enzymes in the mouth. I understand all that, but this is the first real step of the digestive process is the acidification of that food in the stomach. The problem is a lot of people are not making enough stomach acid for a wide variety of reasons. And when you can't acidify that food, it has to break down by process of like rotting and fermenting. And that rotting and fermenting takes a lot longer to break the food down than just acidifying it would. And remember that the reason that we eat food is to get the nutrients out of that food. So if it's not acidified correctly so that it can be broken down and it's doing this rotting and fermenting as it moves through the system, it's going to move a lot slower because it's going to take the body a lot longer to get the nutrients out of that food. So why wouldn't it move slower? So 
One thing you're gonna hear as well is, oh, well, there's all these hormones involved, so you have a hormonal issue that's causing trouble and it's not moving things along. And let's look at this study here on drugs affecting gastrointestinal motility. And they say the principal local hormones that modulate gut motility are ghrelin, cholecystokinin, motilin, glucagon-like peptide, serotonin, and dopamine. But let's really look at the cholecystokinin as a very important player here. And that's something that exists mostly here in the duodenum, which is the first 10 inches of the small intestine. And when we look at this Science Direct page on cholecystokinin, they say the principal physiological actions of CCK, CCK is what all the cool kids call cholecystokinin, but they say is to stimulate gallbladder contraction, to relax the sphincter of OD, and to stimulate secretion of pancreatic juice rich in digestive enzymes. Other functions are stimulation of bicarbonate-rich fluid secretion, insulin secretion, and intestinal motility. So they're saying that this cholecystokinin is part of this thing that moves things along. So what happens is when the acidic food comes down here into the duodenum, that triggers the cholecystokinin to say, hey gallbladder, it's time to drop this alkaline bile down so that we can emulsify our dietary fats and neutralize acids that are coming from the food. It tells the pancreas to squirt out the bicarb to help us neutralize those acids and all the enzymes that help us digest and break down that food correctly. But even on the basic Encyclopedia Britannica website, they tell us that cholecystokinin secretion is stimulated by the introduction of hydrochloric acid, amino acids, or fatty acids into the stomach or duodenum. So they're letting us know that this cholecystokinin is triggered by stomach acid. Now it could be triggered by amino acids, but we get amino acids by breaking down protein and we need stomach acid to do that. And a lot of people don't eat very much dietary fat at all. They think that that's not right. They're running in horror from dietary fats like they're still living in the 80s. They're eating this low-fat diet while they're watching the A-team. So there's a lot of things that don't have an opportunity to tell cholecystokinin that it's time to go into action to trigger all of these other functions and to help things move through the system like it should. And we'll put a link in the description below for our video on bile acid reflux to help you understand why this lack of acid in the stomach can cause bile to pool back up into the stomach, like MIMH was asking about. So you can see, even when we're talking about hormonal problems, this stomach acid is the first step. If that first step is not there, then why would everything else go according to plan? Anything you do in life, if you do it wrong, it's usually gonna take a lot longer. If you try to take a shower without turning the water on, that's gonna take longer. The water is the first step of that process. You'll be like, ah oh, man, I can't get all this shampoo out of my hair. And of course, authorities will be like, you know, let's try a different shampoo. But the, the rinsing, you know what? Let's put in some type of dispersing agent that will separate the shampoo from your hair follicles and allow it to fall off a lot easier. The water! You know, there's not a lot of evidence for water and for this soap that's stuck all over your body. Why don't we try a dry brushing technique that'll get all the filth and stench off of your body? But water! You know, we need the first step happening. If that's not happening, why would the rest happen? Now, other issues that we need to think about when we're looking at this all being too alkaline and moving much slower is, yes, the stomach acid is very important to kind of make that bolus the right pH that will move through, but in a lot of cases, there are invaders that we have to deal with. Maybe someone has a bacterial overgrowth in the stomach, like an H. pylori issue, or some type of SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or some yeast mold fungal type overgrowth situation. A lot of these varmints put out type waste type products that are alkaline. So they could be further alkalizing this whole track and making things move through a whole lot slower. They have the ability here in the stomach to neutralize acids that your stomach might be making. So that can reduce your ability to acidify your food and then things are gonna move slow and when they come out here, they're gonna be more alkaline. They're not gonna be acidic enough to trigger the cholecystokinin to say, hey, it's time to get everything into action. So it makes sense that these things would go slower when that acid is not there. Another thing we need to understand is that the acid doesn't just help us acidify the food, it's the barrier that keeps all the bad guys that are coming in on the food that we're eating. They're supposed to die in an acid bath. 
So when we don't have enough stomach acid, which can happen for a lot of reasons, now they're coming in, they're setting up camp, they're having a keg party, it's a really great time. Let's look at this study on dysmotility and PPI use are independent risk factors for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And they say that the majority of patients in this study, 76% with dysmotility, had SIBO, SIFO, or a mix of both. Similarly, 75% of patients on PPI therapy had cultures that were positive for bacteria and or fungal organisms. So they're showing us that when we turn off stomach acid, like we're using a PPI, it just opens the front door and then a lot of these bad guys can come in. But keep in mind that somebody doesn't need to be using a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor that turns off stomach acid. This is a medication they use for acid reflux a lot. Someone doesn't need to be on a medication like that. There's lots of things that can restrict a person's ability to make that hydrochloric acid correctly. So in that study, they're looking at is dysmotility caused by PPI use or slow motility or is it a combination of things? But you can see that slow motility can be caused by a lack of acid, which allows the SIBO or whatever kind of bacterial overgrowth to come in and set up camp. And then all of those things could create the slow motility. So it might be common to see all those things together, but is one really causing the other? And the final thing that I'm not going to go too deep in this video on, I've talked about it in a lot of other videos, is water traffic. And a person can be dealing with an imbalance at the cellular level that we call an anabolic imbalance, where they're kind of stuck in that daytime state most of the time. And that can cause the body to send too much water to the kidneys and not enough to the bowels. So when not enough of the water is being sent to the bowels, it can kind of cause all that stuff to be too dry and hard, and then it's going to be a lot harder to move through the system. So when things are moving slow, that has the ability to be a factor that I just like people to be aware of. Um, but these are the main things we want to look at. When we're looking at trying to correct this issue, we have to look at the digestive malfunctions that are going on. It's very common for someone not to be making enough stomach acid, and it's also very common for this bile to become too thick and sticky to flow correctly. And then all these things are not coming down into the duodenum and triggering everything else to happen, and it can really cause a lot of havoc. So any malfunctions that are going on are very important, especially this acidification thing. And there's ways a person can acidify their stomach using like, you know, betaine HCL capsules. Some people might be able to use a little bit of apple cider vinegar, but that's usually not going to be enough for someone that's dealing with slow motility. Plus the ACV can magnify this water traffic problem for some people. So we really like for people to look at their chemistry and understand where their body is and get an idea of what the actual underlying causes are for them. So if you're new to this channel and you don't know how to do that, we'll put a link in the description below for our totally free digestion course. And that totally free course will walk you through figuring out what's going on with your specific system and steps that are really going to help you correct those things. So that can be important, but if there's an overgrowth, we also need to take steps to reduce that overgrowth. There's lots of natural steps a person can take to kind of wipe out bad bacteria or fungal issues in the stomach. We have a lot of videos where we talk about that, but that free course will walk you through that too. And then if someone's dealing with an anabolic imbalance, that can be important. And that free course walks you through figuring out if that might be a problem for you as well. But when you can reacidify the stomach, and even take steps to help the stomach make more hydrochloric acid on its own, now you're going to have an acidic bolus, bolus moving through here so that when these other alkaline substances come in, it will end up at the right pH to move through. And everything's being signaled to move through. All these contractions and relaxations that happen, they say that it's, oh, it's by the stretch, but it seems that there's also other signals, and the pH of what's going through there seems to be a major factor for that. And when you can reduce the overgrowth, now they're not putting out all that alkaline waste that's going to slow things down and things can move through at the right pace. But, you know, the trick is when you're trying to acidify, a lot of people, especially if they're just going to use betaine HCL capsules, if there's an overgrowth in there, putting acid in there is going to magnify a lot of the symptoms that you're dealing with because you have all this acid mixing with this alkaline waste and it creates this fizzy mess in the stomach where it really shouldn't be. So somebody really wants to know how to use HCL. So that free course that I talked about in the description below will show you how to use that the right way and to understand the steps that you might need to take before it's time to use that HCL to reduce any magnification of symptoms that might come about. 
So fixing this issue could be as simple as acidifying the stomach for some folks, but the process to do that can be a little bit tricky and create discomfort for some people, so you wanna learn how to avoid that. So I hope that helps, and if you wanna learn more about how to acidify the stomach, you can jump over right now and check out our video on steps to acidify the stomach. And if you think you might have an overgrowth issue, you could check out our video on steps to wipe out bad bacteria in the stomach. I can't wait to hear about your results.